ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानाजनिशलाकाया चक्षुरोन्मील तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नम ओं विष्णुपादाय कृष्ण प्रस्था भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नमिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातारिणे वाचाकलतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा थैंक यू फॉर योर पेशेंस माय डिले माय एपोलॉजीज सो टुडे वी आर डिस्कसिंग अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग सेक्शन फ्रॉम द भागवतम कैन यू प्लीज i am also joined through my tablet can you please uh, make the tablet also as a co-host that is ccd so this section of the bhagavatam primarily focuses on, on the theme of how two things how the bhag how bhakti philosophy or bhakti message can also be explained in a enigmatic puzzling kind of way and it's it can be also very intellectually stimulating titillating whatever word you want to use and also how narad muni focuses on pronunciation so i'll talk this in two broad terms it's this particular past time in the sixth canto if you can see the sixth canto is the screen visible the color is clear for you yes prabhu ji okay so if we consider here there are many many things going on in the bhagavatam if we consider the overall bhagavatam first canto to 12th canto the purpose is to there is one purpose of the bhagavatam we could say it is to focus on krishna hmm? and this is specifically for shukdev goswami shukdev goswami doing this for parishit maharaj but that remembrance of krishna through the uh, specifically through specific through specifically through the process of glorification that is the purpose of the bhagavatam and all the past times that are there in the bhagavatam they are at one level if you say they are directly krishna's past times they they become like resource for remembering krishna if we like like we have in the 10th canto hmm. but apart from that we have devotees past times and these devotees past times what they do is they can also be resource for remembering krishna but they can be inspiration for remembering krishna Okay, this is how in this particular devotee, this particular situation, say Ajamil, he just chanted once the name of Krishna of Narayan, even that too unintentionally. We can say, and he was not even a devotee, but it is devotees' pastimes, or we could say human beings who become devotees, their pastimes. So we could say in the process of remembrance of Krishna, there are two things. There is the guru. and there the shishya hmm? so now the guru is the person who is the giver of okay what happened over here sorry Oh. am i audible and visible to you yes yes, yes. so so the, okay so the guru and shishya 
working on this is. Let's be sorry. So we have the Guru and Shishya. So now there are the Guru can, Guru is meant to offer both resources for remembering Krishna and inspiration for remembering Krishna. Now this can be done in many different ways. So the teacher is the person, Srila, Srila Prabhupada himself said at one point, now there are two different statements of Srila Prabhupada. One he says, I am just like a postman. I didn't change a single word. I simply repeated the process repeated the message of my Guru Maharaj. That's what Prabhupada said. But in other place, especially when Prabhupada is talking about nectar of devotion in his lectures, he says, I practically invented the Krishna consciousness movement. Now, what is he meaning by that? So here Prabhupada says that he is primarily talking about somehow or the other remember Krishna. That is, and he said that when he says I practically invented the Krishna conscious movement means that he is saying that I provided you could say innovative ways of remembering Krishna of connecting with Krishna of serving Krishna right now the uh, book which is marathon is going on now there was traditionally there is no such thing like a marathon or even the idea of book distribution is not very common or widespread within the broad Vedic tradition. The Brahmanas give knowledge, but the idea of giving books and having targets and then having deadlines to meet the targets. What is this? This was Prabhupada's resourceful way of doing many things. Of what was Prabhupada was channeling the Rajoguna of his young disciples. So if you consider this, what was channeling Rajoguna, then he was adapting to the Western culture. And, and traditionally, uh, the sadhus would just go and ask for bhiksha and then they would give some wisdom to those who were receiving it. Uh, but in the West, if somebody just, the idea of a sacred beggar, the idea, sometimes the word mendicant, which is bhikshuk, mendicant is not at all equal to a beggar. That's how it is translated. A bhikshu is actually, uh, they, they are asking for arms, but actually they are giving something higher. So that idea of a mendicant, it is very much a part of the Eastern tradition, but it is very little present in the Western tradition. Hmm? The Christian monks, they would never go out and seek arms, the Catholic monks. And Protestants, they don't even have monks. In fact, most of the Protestants are aggressively against monkhood. So, Prabhupada recognized that this is if I send disciples out to seek arms, that's not going to work. So, Prabhupada created book distribution and served many things, not just it adapting to Western culture, it also was a way of uh, providing spiritual knowledge or providing access to spiritual knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, Prabhupada did many things, and most important, while he was doing all this, the devotees. Their minds were absorbed in Krishna, They're thinking about Krishna, how to present the Gita's, how to present the book's wisdom, how to conduct oneself, how to pray to Krishna, how to be inspired in the Krishna conscious environment. So the point I'm making over here is that this guru has to be creative and resourceful to help the disciple remember Krishna. And that applies even to any teacher. So depending on the Le the level, the needs, the, the overall situation of the disciples. So the guru is here and the disciple is here. So now the guru wants to basically help the disciple remember Krishna. But this has to be done in many resourceful ways. So how do you provide remembrance of Krishna? So if we consider Narad Muni to be like the exemplary guru. Here, Narad Muni is actually offering what you could say an intellectually stimulating way of remembering Krishna. What it means is that he is challenging the students. The, what he speaks, basically what he does is, he speaks like a riddle. 
and he is speaking to the Hari Ashwas and the Baul Ashwas. So when he speaks this, what is the idea? He sees their caliber. There are other places, say when Narad Muni speaks to Dhruva, now he is not speaking in riddles over there. When Narad Muni is speaking to, say, Murugari, he is not speaking in riddles over there. But here he sees this is what is required for them to get the message. And if that's what is required, that is what will be provided to them. So broadly speaking, we can say, this is Bhakti Yoga. Now people can come to Bhakti Yoga from the Karma Marga. Hmm? Or they can come to Bhakti Yoga from the Jnana Marga. Now ultimately, when you want to practice Bhakti, it is Jnana Karmadi Anavritam. We want to be free from karma and we want to be free from jnana. Not actually free in the sense of getting rid of it, but free from the worldviews and the motivations associated with the karma marga and the jnana marga. So there are different ways in which people can come to bhakti. So for example, if you consider Dhru Maharaj, Dhru Maharaj, Narad Muni instructed him and Dhru Maharaj also came to bhakti. But that was largely the karma marga. Karma marga means that Dhru Maharaj wanted a kingdom. And when Narad Muni tried to speak philosophy to him, he said, actually, honor and dishonor, they're all temporary, they're all peripheral, they don't affect the soul. Why are you getting so disturbed by this insult? Dhru Maharaj said that what you're saying is true, but it finds no place in my heart. And so please give me an instruction that is workable for me. And he gave him that instruction accordingly. So for him, at that point, he just wanted a kingdom. And if that's what he wanted, that's what he was provided. And then he was told to do some rituals, some austerities, pray to the Lord, and eventually he got the kingdom. But when he got the kingdom, or rather when he got the darshan of the Lord, instead of asking for the kingdom, he felt, my dear Lord, you are so much sweeter. You are a source of such greater happiness. Why should I seek anything else? And so that is from the karma mark to come to bhakti. So in karma mark, the message is simple. It is more of this is what you do. Practice this, practice this, practice this, practice this. Now, in jnana marga, the message has to be to some extent complex. Now, why complex? Because those who come from the jnana marga they are philosophically oriented. They have questions. And unless those questions are answered in a rational, systematic way, unless their intellect is stimulated, hey, this is something deep. This is something profound. Otherwise, they will not connect with it. So that is required for those who come from the Jnana Mark. And that is what is being provided here. So Narad Muni is demonstrating the resourcefulness of the, of the spiritual teacher, of the guru, that if somebody needs a complicated message, that's what will make them get it. Mm -hmm. So then that's what has to be provided to them. We'll say, now Prabhupada said, God is a person. Mm -hmm. And that was what Prabhupada said. And now when Prabhupada is describing his own Guru Maharaj, what he said was, absolute is sentient, thou hast proved. Uh, impersonal calamity, that's allowed. Now, essentially these two statements make this, mean the same thing. Hmm? So, God is a person, absolute is sentient. So these two are the same statements, but we'll see the level of complexity of thought, the level of sophistication of articulation, the level of intellectual engagement needed to understand that statement will be different. Or let's consider another statement of so, so Krishna is beyond the senses. Hmm? Krishna is beyond the senses. That is a statement that Srila Prabhupada sometimes makes. He would use the word, explain the word adhokshaja. Now, Bhakti Siddhanta he had a statement that he says the materialistic demeanor 
cannot, I'm paraphrasing it also, materialist demeanor cannot stretch to the domain of the transcendental autocrat, something like that. Stretch to the domain of the transcendental autocrat. So now, what is he saying over here? He's saying the same thing that we cannot understand Krishna through our senses. But this statement, you may say, why do you want to complicate things? It's simple. Well, but for some people, it can be too simple. And then they will not feel stimulated. They will not feel connected. Hey, if it's so simple, it can't be true. The truth has to be profound. Well, actually, something can be profound and also simple. But sometimes some people need a complex way of presenting things. So this particular section of the Bhagavatam echoes, it's an echo of the Upanishadic approach. The Upanishadic approach is basically for those who are intellectual, those who are the Jnana Marga. So the Upanishads speak things indirectly through metaphors, through, through stories from, from which the inference is something which we have to draw. And that is what people need. Some people need that. So, His Holiness Devamrut Maharaj has written a book, Searching for Vedic India. It is very intellectually stimulating. So, when I was talking with Maharaj about that book, he said, Maharaj, the book is wonderful. I felt that they needed one last chapter which put together the whole world view. Hmm? Uh, then that would have been much more impactful. Maharaj said, no. He said that I was aiming this book primarily for Ivy League students. And for those kind of students of that caliber, they, they would feel their intelligence insulted if everything is given in a ready-made package to them. Well, okay, you tell me the points, I will figure out. I'm intelligent enough to figure things out. So don't spoon feed me. So, so for them, sometimes if things are made too simple, then they feel that, so what happens is for some people, uh, simplicity, if the simplicity is there, they feel that intelligence is not taxed. Yeah, you know, why do you have to think so much? Can you, can't you explain this simply? The intelligence is not taxed. And that's what they like. But for some people, if simplicity is there, they feel their intelligence is insulted. Oh, why are you spoon feeding me like this? This is also a different demographic. So depending on the demographic we are addressing, demographic is the kind of people, the particular group that we are addressing, we have to be aware and we have to present accordingly. So here the Bhagavatam is echoing the Upanishads and is actually telling something which is a very, in one sense, if you look at how the metaphor that is used and this particular verse, you know, I can go into the particular verse, but I was planning to speak more on the broader principle of why this approach is there in the Bhagavatam. That the particular verse talks about how this is a house and this is this and this is that. And then that particular riddle has to be figured out. And there's a separate section where the riddle is being explained. But the, the Haryasha is able to figure it out. And that's what stimulates them. We can look at it as falena parichayate. As Prabhupada said, a thing is known by its fruit. So Narad Muni's approach of being very intellectually sophisticated over there, that has the desired fruit. And the desired fruit is that they are all so inspired by the message that they say, I, we want to surrender to him, surrender to the Lord, you know, renounce the world, focus entirely on him right away. That's glorious. That's what happens and that is glorious. So now considering this point, the next thing is that what approach do we use? In general, each one of us has our own nature. Like, let's consider something like Kirtan. Hmm? Say so somebody who is, most of us, we may like Hare Krishna Dhun, we may like some simple tunes. Hmm? 
and our point is that we want to be absorbed in Krishna. And sometimes some people have very comp some singers. They sing in such complex tunes that for most of the audience, if the simple tunes, there is participation. It is participatory basically. It is a kirtan in which others are participating. When the complex tunes are there, then it becomes more performatory than participatory. That means the singer is singing in such a way that the audience can watch and the audience can be out. Those who actually understand the musical sense, those who see, okay, how powerful the throat is and those things. Those, uh, those who see that, they can, mm, mm, uh, they can actually see. Uh, so, uh, so they can actually see that here. This is such a, this person has such great musical talent, but for most people, they will not be able to follow it. Now, should, if somebody has great musical ability, uh, should they be told you have to always sing simple tunes? No, they should be using this musical ability. But then if they're going to do a kirtan for the masses, then if there they start using very complicated tunes where the whole purpose is to get everyone to participate and to sing and dance and experience ecstasy, then maybe the complex tune is not right over there. The, but if some, some people are really music lovers and for them, if we use very sweet, subtle, complex tunes, they will love it. Both are absorbing themselves in Krishna, but both are absorbing themselves in Krishna in different ways. So similarly, you know, with respect to the philosophical message, you know, it can be simple for the mass, mass audience. And it may need to be complex. Sometimes the word complex has a negative connotation. It needs to be supple, it needs to be subtle, it needs to be profound for the class audience. Now, again, this is a generalization. By class, and class can be in many different ways. But especially if somebody is more Brahminically oriented, and not only Brahminically oriented in terms of wanting to do Brahminical rituals, but Brahminically oriented in terms of very serious about Shastric study, about philosophical understanding. And for them, some messages can be very simple and they will not understand it. Srila Prabhupada himself told the Bhaktivedanta Institute scientists, what he told them, he, you said, you speak the Vedic message in their language. In scientific language, Prabhupada said. Why? Because for them, the idea that if somebody says Krishna is God, that is not something which an intellectual might be able to appreciate. So for them, we may say that Krishna represents or Krishna manifests the, the primordial cosmological principle in the primeval personal manifestation. So, hey, what is that? Use that kind of language, primordial cosmological principle in the primeval personal manifestation. So now for most people, they say, what, is, what does this mean? Primordial cosmic principle, primeval personal manifestation. So it doesn't make much sense. But for people who are intellectually oriented, they they will be very touched by, it. oh, Krishna is that. First you can say Krishna manifests and then Krishna is that. They will be able to accept it much more easily. So there are times when a more philosophically intricate message is what will attract some students. Now the challenge is to know the audience. Sometimes we may give a very complex message to our audience which requires a simple message. And sometimes we may give a simple message to an audience that requires a complex message. So that's why understanding the audience is very important. We, I'll conclude, I'll conclude with this point that if we have to understand the audience, 
then okay this is what is going on over here then we will be able to figure out how should i speak i'll conclude with a personal incident i have been traveling abroad for i started traveling from outside america outside india from 2014 and as well as radhanath maharaj a spiritual master is encouraging me to focus on western outreach and spend time in the west overall so every year when i every after every tour i generally meet him and give a report to him so i am in 2018 after i had come back from a tour i met maharaj i think it was not 2018 2019 just before the pandemic so i told maharaj several devotees told me that my classes are very intellectual and he said that they find people find it difficult to understand the classes but i said maharaj but i find it you know I, i find it difficult to change it is not that i am being intellectual this is just the way i think and that's the way i present so it's difficult for me to change so maharaj said that no, you don't have to change yourself he said that if you if you try to be humorous like gaur gopal prabhu that will not work if gaur gopal prabhu tries to be intellectual like you that will not work and then maharaj in his sweet disarming humility he said that as far as i am concerned i am neither humorous like gaur gopal prabhu nor intellectual like you so i i stopped and i said maharaj maharaj whatever abilities we have it's all by your mercy maharaj but maharaj became grave and he said but i have but krishna has gifted me with a deep concern for others and with that concern in my heart whatever i speak it seems to inspire others so he says you don't have to change yourself but you just increase your concern for your audience so that was a profound instruction for me so if say i'm a, if this is a teacher and there is a student now each teacher will have their own nature the teacher can't change but so the teacher's nature is to some extent it is fixed but the student have their own nature and that is fixed but what we can do is at least say say if this is the circle of the teacher's nature and this is the circle of the student's nature then if the teacher at least makes the effort to understand the student what is the what understand the increase the concern of the audience increase the concern for the audience not increase the concern of the audience increase the concern of the audience when the audience gets worried what is going on over here then what the teacher can do is find an intersection so the teacher's nature student nature so and in this intersection the teacher concentrates the message then that is where the communication will become more effective so it was after that interaction with maharaj i started thinking of what i could do i wanted to convey deep concepts i wanted to analyze things deeply that's the way I, uh, that's the way i that's what convinces me that's what attracts me but sometimes that can become too taxing for the audience so one of the things that i started doing was making powerpoints to try to illustrate the concepts so during the pandemic i made more than 1000 powerpoints but then i found even the powerpoints were restrictive because it's all i have to prepare it and i have to stick to what is there in the powerpoint so recently i started making using this tablets where as i'm thinking i am illustrating so what happens is this makes it it helps the communication to become more effective so we need to understand our audience so oh, if we understand the audience as much as possible then we can try to make the communication more effective in general if we consider our movement is con if we consider in the west broadly speaking you know we have indians who are coming to iskon and we have that's like a large number of indians and we have relatively small number of westerners coming so now the way the same message has to be presented to indians the same message has to be presented to westerners but the focus needs to be different the focus is often if it is not understood properly what is the what is the what are the needs interests concerns of the audience so for most indians it's more of 
preserving our culture. Hmm? Uh, okay, you know, I want my children, I don't want them to become like Western, Western kids who are into drugs and so many things. I want them to know about our culture. And that's why I also want to follow the culture. So the culture is relatively important. And the, that kind of presentation is what appeals. By, by culture, I mean more of the religious culture in terms of the practices. But for the Western people, the culture, it may be one fact which brings curiosity. But for them, often it is existential needs and questions. Existential needs and questions. So what is the purpose of life? You know, my mind is so disturbed. What can help me to calm my mind? The mind disturbance is something which is there for everyone. But the more the social structure becomes unstable, relationships are not stable, families are not stable, the mind's instability increases that much more or manifold more. So what is happening is that if we understand this, then we can present, tune the message appropriately. So sometimes if we recognize the, the message, the, 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 what is the need of the audience and then present accordingly, then we will be much more effective in different places. So that expert in Narmuni is demonstrating through this pastime where he's offering a very intellectually sophisticated presentation of spiritual wisdom. So I'll summarize. I discussed three main points today. The first point was about the Bhagavatam's purpose is to fix the mind on Krishna. Uh, but that purpose, there is a, there is a flexible process for that. Uh, and that's what we were, that was the, the Prabhupada said, I have not changed one word, but I have invented the Krishna conscious movement. The message of fixing on the mind in Krishna is fixed. But how to fix the mind in Krishna, that is variable. I gave the example of Prabhupada doing book distribution and introducing book distribution as a way of connecting with people. And then the second point I talked about was how different people need different things. Some people need simple presentations and some people need complex presentations. So generally those who come from the Karma Marga, they will need a simple presentation, simple message. Those who come from the Jnana Marga, they will need a more complex presentation. And Narad Muni does both. Narad Muni does this for Dhruva Maharaj. Narad Muni does this for the Haryashwas. And the last part I discussed was, and for us, what can we do? We can't change our nature, but we can try to understand our audience. And then find the intersection point between what is our nature and what is the audience nature and then present. That will make it much more effective. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Hare Krishna, Anuradha Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Prabhu. Very, very as usual. Very wonderful class. Prabhu, Mike, I had a, like, not related to the class, but as you were talking about preaching towards the end, how we have to understand the audience and also, uh, I mean, we can't change our nature and there should be an intersection. So, Prabhu, do you take any, I mean, is there any workshop which you conduct for the preachers and, you know, is there something? And if there is, how do we access it, Prabhu? Yes, I'm planning that till now. I have not done any specific workshops, but I'm planning that soon with probably the Bhagavad Vidya Pitha. So I'll keep you informed about that. See, in general, uh, on my YouTube channel, I talk something about Western outreach. I have a class on uh, communication. So those are, it's not a systematic course, but there are some broad classes. So yes, I, I am planning to do that in the future. Mm, thank you for... Yeah, question. thank you. Thank yeah, you so much, Prabhu. And we look forward. Yes, Prabhu. We are like, uh, we, we are in a community, Kalachanji, Dallas, and we are mixed of Western devotees and Indian devotees. And the way we approach is completely different, Prabhu, the way whether they are, not we approach, how they are. And um, it's, 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 we, have to, it's, we have to immediately switch the gear when we are, you know, approaching the Western 
devotees and the Indian devotees. So, and it is very difficult at times sitting, uh, you know, when whether through a class or any discussion to get through both. So it will be so helpful if we have something and if we can access it to, to please think about yes. it, Prabhu, and start it soon. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Yes, I think it is a big challenge. Generally, there are I mean, two broad approaches to Western outreach. One is like, you have two parallel streams and keep them parallel. At Western Outreach is one, Indian Outreach is another. And we have separate centers for each of those. But the problem with this approach is that many problems. Uh, one of the big problems is that the second generation or third generation Indians, they don't really, those who are born and brought up in America or in the Western world, you know, they don't really fall in the category of Indians. They're not Westerners completely. They don't fall in the category. So what about all those who fall in the middle? Mm -hmm. But if we bring both of them together or we just keep one track for both of them, that doesn't work. That's a big problem. So generally the idea right now is we have to have two different tracks and then gradually bring the tracks together. So, but exactly how that is to be done, there is a challenge. So... That means initially we have separate outreach centers for Western devotees, separate outreach center for Indian devotees. And then after a year or two, after they have become a little more st uh, uh, stabilized in bhakti, then the two can be uh, brought together. That's the approach which seems to be working, but it's not always, there's no one, one approach that has been so successful that it can be replicated everywhere, but definitely different dynamics are involved. Thank you, Prabhu. And one more thing, as you are discussing, I was also thinking, many of the training, uh, if it, it is made accessible for the grihasthas also, especially in US, I was thinking, don't know about India, but you know, often we don't know what's happening like as, as a preacher, but few of the communities are completely run by the grihasthas. So if we yeah. can also be trained when we go on Harinam or either way, we often don't know how to behave with the Westerner and we treat them the same way we do with the Indians, you know, little more intruding and interfering, which they may yeah. not appreciate. So if, if the Grihasthas can also be trained, though, of course, those who are in yes. interested, that will be that wonderful is, for the movement. Of, that is one thinking. big difference between the Western and Indian. You know, we can, maybe we can talk about this separately and we can plan some module also if that much is your interest. See, this is, this is the authority and this is subordinate. This is broadly Indian or Eastern culture. It's not just Indian, Eastern also. And this has been the way ISKCON has been presenting traditionally. And we are even now successful. In Russia, we are successful. Ukraine, we are successful. In China also, at underground level, we are successful. Where the, where the mainstream culture is quite vertical, hierarchical. There, our approach has been successful. But the Western approach is largely egalitarian. It's, uh, it's more of the authority and subordinate are more or less equal. The boss is still the boss, but it is not that there's a lot of show of external deference for the boss. So this vertical approach doesn't work much for people who have grown up with the horizontal approach. That's the way they are. So now, while it, we say that we have to follow the instruction of the spiritual master, and that is true, but then yeah, this, is a, this is instruction. But then we also have the example of negotiation, as I said. Dhruva Maharaj speaking, Narad Muni, and Dhruva Maharaj speaking, Narad Muni gives a particular instruction. Dhruva Maharaj says, it's not possible for me. And Narad Muni gives another instruction. So Narad Muni is not saying, you don't know who I am. I am the Guru of Vyas Dev. How dare you think that I can't, uh, that I don't know what is good for you? How dare you challenge my instruction? Narad Muni doesn't do that. Narad Muni negotiates and tell, gives him something which is workable. So a much more horizontal approach is required and that is not easy to do. So yes, maybe you can contact me separately and then we can think of something if there is a, there's a lot of interest and I'm happy to do something in the near future also. Okay, thank you. Are there... Um... Thank you so much, Prabhu. I will contact you. Thank you, Prabhu. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I see some other questions. Yes, Sukhakar Prabhu. As usual, your classes are really very intellectual, but very deep-rooted, and uh, I really love your class. Just I want to know, you said that you have to see the audience and 
they will present in such a way. If they are a simple audience, even a simple way. If there are little educated people, you do it in a different allegorical, uh, complicated way, but the same message. But when we give the lecture, there's always uh, the, the speaker has an intention I have to impress. I to give something good PowerPoint presentation. One is for understanding, one is for the sort of getting a good name. So that is bad. Your intention to present to get the name and fame that is again going for some desire. Or it is good that you should present the best way, high level. Uh, so there is always a confusion. It can be very simple, a very simple class. Sometimes you see the big qualified people are from IIT and also then you have to do it in a different way. The same thing to be presented in a sophisticated way. So how it, it should not uh, take your pride or all ego level when you are preaching, or it should not. It should be as you said, Professor, that it should reach the heart and there should change. That should be the prayer and intention. Yeah. So. So, okay. Now you are you are bringing a different dynamic over here. You can see this is the teacher. This is a student. So I was talking about the effect on the student and the students can either be they may need a simple presentation they may need a complex presentation hmm? oh. but what you are talking about is sometimes the teacher has their oh. own dynamic the teacher oh. can can seek popularity and pride and ah. that's why they may give a particular kind of presentation hmm? oh. so now sometimes a relatively simple presentation with a lot of humor with a lot of uh, entertaining stories um, that right. can get a lot of popularity now is that a bad mm. thing see popular there is a difference between popularity and populism the two are not the same mm. so the two are not the same populism is where like for example a political leader uh. just gives freebies uh. so that they can get votes now, oh, if you vote for me, uh, I'll give everybody free electricity, free water supply, free school, free this, free that. And how can you do that uh, when there is no economy? You don't have the money for that. You do that now, you mm. get elected, the politician gets elected, but the but the government becomes bankrupted in two, three, four years. And a huge ballooning national debt yeah. or state debt. So populism is basically, it is short-sighted. Or it, you can say short-sighted and self-interested. Self selfish, selfish, yeah. Okay. Self seeking, you know. Whereas, mm. now, do we want popularity? Well, it is not that we want popularity for our sake, but we want Krishna's message to reach a wide audience. So, popularity uh, itself is not bad. Prabhupada will also say that, um, like, uh, he would say that the test of a Vaishnava, I would quote Bhaktivinoda Thakur, the test of a Vaishnava is how many Vaishnavas have you made? Hmm? So, uh, so Prabhupada would say that means, and Prabhupada would say that in that sense, that's not a wrong thing. So mm. sometimes some people will like, some speakers are naturally humorous. Some people are just beautiful storytellers. Well, that's, mm. I'm not using storytelling in a negative sense. I'm just saying that that's their ability. Now, while having that, while using that ability, how much Krishna are they giving with that? Mm. That is something which they have to be careful. Mm. Mm. So when that happens, then that sweat enables uh, uh, that's the test. So if the person is sincere, then they will surely mm. bring an adequate amount of Krishna and Krishna conscious message along with the humor and other things. And sometimes they may just not do that to reach a particular audience, which is okay if that's what the audience needs. Now, are they doing it for popularity? We don't know anyone's heart. So we don't have to necessarily judge people for that. But we have to see when I am speaking a point, you know, is it that how do I decide the test success of my class? How much did people laugh during my class? Oh, sometimes this, the audience may have a laughter test for the good class. Oh, there's so many jokes, mm. wonderful class. Well, neither the audience nor the speaker should actually be testing <laughs> a class based on the laughter test. Laughter is good. There's nothing wrong at all in laughter. But how much laughter is there in the class is not the criteria for a good class. The good class is where mm. there is good content and then there is humor also with it. So like that, mm. we have to find that balance. And uh, if we can become, if, if pride, now pride is always a concern. 
uh, that is that is a that is a challenge which we all always have to face and is it that a particular mm. approach will protect us from pride is it a simple presentation will protect us from pride not necessary no, the my my is so mm. subtle i somebody gives a very simple basic presentation i am simply following shri prabhupad and then i no i don't get so some that person doesn't get so much fame or popularity or whatever then will that will that mean that they will be free from pride well so somebody gives a simple presentation and they say there's no pride in me my pride is going down but then somebody else gives a more uh, more complex or a uh, sophisticated presentation and then they become popular so what happens is our we do not have pride but we have envy for them our envy for that person increases mm. so it's a subtle thing that i may sing i may sing prabhupad tune and i may feel satisfied and i say i am faithfully following prabhupad and somebody else starts singing hari krishna in what we consider the bollywood tune and we oh. think that you know this person is compromising but people love it and then we start we start resenting that person so the point is are we krishna conscious whether we are being simple or sophisticated let us see are we krishna conscious and are we helping others become krishna conscious so for some people trying to be simple may take them away from krishna consciousness for some people mm. trying to be complex may take them away from krishna consciousness so we just focus on focus on how can i be krishna conscious so as as a speaker and as as a as a could say the teacher and as a student so if we focus on that then we will find our way ahead so the bottom line is how much uh, proportional jeev they are doing how many people are being brought into krishna consciousness they start chanting that will be the uh, meter point to know that whether we are yes. effective in uh, in class yes yes sir perfect thank you so, thank you very much prabhu thank you thank you thank you thank you so now there are a couple of questions how can we different when it is bhakti sentiment or other kinds of things as it is uh, it is quite a big question over here uh, in general bhakti sentiment is not a bad thing it is there is sentiment and there is sentimentality so sentiment is something which we want because every relationship will have sentiments in it uh, but sentimentality is it is actually it is being controlled by emotions so this is where it's bad so how do we do that basically whatever it is whatever sentiment it is whatever it is not is it if if it is proper sentiment then what it will do is it will reinforce our bhakti practice our standard bhakti practices that means if i experience some sentiment while while say doing kirtan while doing puja if i get a dream of krishna now can krishna come in my dream or any any devotee's dream who is going to stop krishna krishna is omnipotent but if after waking up from the dream i think oh i am so special krishna came in my dream so i am krishna conscious even my sleep also i don't need to chant hari krishna this sadhana is for new five devotees then that is wrong but if i think that oh krishna is coming my dream krishna blessed me krishna is so kind to me let me reciprocate by becoming more devoted to him let me then that is anukul so sentiment is positive so and last question is now uh, thank you for your other appreciative comments also i'm happy to be of service uh which is center of audience while uh, communication how to identify the intersection okay generally um, it's difficult to know from the beginning but as we interact with people so if we just try to hear them and try to understand where they are coming from then we will find out more about them bhakti is actually about it is reciprocation so when we are speaking it's important to speak but it's also important to hear so especially if we are focusing on a particular demographic we are going to reach a particular kind of people we are in a particular locality then we talk with people sometimes we just think oh people are just talking mundane things i don't want to talk with them that may be true 
but sometimes even in the mundane there may be an opportunity to bring in some spirituality so that's why we need to hear from people so and there's a teacher and there's a student it is not just teacher is giving the message the teacher is also hearing from the student uh, sally agarwal the person who at whose place shila prabhupad stayed sally and gopal agarwal she her her statements about shila prabhupad are fascinating what he says is that swami ji was in was interested in everything american he said how the vacuum cleaner worked how the the tap worked how the oven worked how this worked how that worked now prabhupad didn't go to america to learn how a vacuum cleaner worked prabhupad was trying to understand how the american mind worked and it was he was i was observing carefully he was understanding his audience is learning about the way his audience thought and functioned and then he presented so i think it's both we just spend some time wherever it is possible hearing the audience hearing the audience also and we learn from them now of course we can't let them speak 90% we speak 10% it is the per, per, per percentage has to be appropriate but generally letting people speak is uh, or hearing people speak is also helpful okay now is there any book for uh darad muni for his understanding drive for teaching i think many devotees have given classes but i don't think there's a book specifically on this topic so thank you very much grantraj shrimad bhagavatam ki jai